Good day. I'm going to talk in my first lecture on the history of computer science about Alan Turing's scholarly legacy. The first part of my talk will be about the 1930s, 1940s and Alan Turing in particular. In the second part I'm going to discuss the 1950s and, and characterize that decade as one of cross-fertilization, fertilization between linguistics, computer programming and logic. We need to do that in order to understand Alan Turing's legacy better. And third, I will say something about becoming a historian or thinking like a historian. I myself have a background in computer science. Saul Gorn is an unsung hero in the history of computer science and I will say something about him. He made Alan Turing a household name in the 1950s. Unfortunately, Saul Gorn is not well known, and I hope to rectify the situation during this talk. Starting with the 1930s and 40s and Alan Turing himself, just to be clear, yeah, by the way, here's a picture of him that was kind of fast, my apologies, but I assume everybody is aware of his 1936 paper on computable numbers and the 1945 first draft of a report on the EDVAC by John von Neumann. Now a central theme of many books is that we have this romantic intellectual connection between Alan Turing and John von Neumann, the two red circles, and this arrow from Alan Turing's 1936 paper to John von Neumann in the mid-40s. And then all these other circles, all these other computer building groups, were, thanks to these two geniuses, finally able to build and program stored program computers. That's the romantic, totally biased, totally incorrect historical account that you find in bestsellers today. Allegedly it is due to the theoretical insights, the theory of Turing and the brilliance of von Neumann that we then have engineers able to enter the digital age. I can also explain all of this by means of the hourglass model. For the historian, the hourglass model is too simple a model to use. Here we have a picture with converging developments towards two geniuses, Turing and von Neumann, and then diverging developments. So everything had to pass via Turing and von Neumann. I will draw the hourglass model again on the blackboard. What we have is that there was a lot going on and the bird's eye view was thanks to Turing and von Neumann and then, as the bottom half of the figure shows, people like Maurice Wilkes, Howard Aiken, all these very successful computer builders could finally get their job done. That is the historically totally incorrect story of the history of first computers, if you like, in post-war years. There is a good thing though about the hourglass model and that is it serves a purpose for those who want to build a science as, is, as in computer science. And I'm not being skeptical or not being ironic. There's a smiley next to the, the title of a book of Martin Davis and his two co-authors because as a computer scientist I can very much appreciate this book which is not about history but about the foundations or the so-called foundations of computer science and then it makes a lot of sense to use the hourglass model or at least the bottom half of the hourglass model. If you look at this 1994 book of Martin Davis you will see that the first chapters are basically providing a recast version of Turing machine computability and all the rest is built up from there. So that makes a lot of sense to work in this manner when you want to, for example, educate students. That's definitely good. Or if one would want to explain in retrospect the relationship between theory and practice. So, yeah, this is probably also the core of the problem. The hourglass model is then implicitly used by prominent computer scientists to then portray 
the history of their own field. And that's where mistakes happen, as I will try to illustrate, or I'll try to convey in a moment. I'm uh, giving this talk from Hale, Belgium. Winter is starting to come, which is why I have to dry my blackboard with a separate piece of cloth. So that will take some time. I am trained in computer science, engineering and also uh, two additional master years uh, in mathematical logic and after those studies I started to delve into the history of computing. Some ten years later I now feel inclined to put some of these lectures online. All right, we have the 1930s, 1940s of Alan Turing. I'm focusing in this lecture on computer building. I am totally ignoring his impact in, for example, the history of recursive function theory, or if you like, computability theory. That will have to be covered in a later lecture. So here we are, the hourglass model, again just one more time, we have a smiley. Why? Well, because it helps for building a science as in computer science. A not so happy face because the hourglass model can also be very misleading if used inappropriately. Two specific examples follow. So we have prominent computer scientists such as J.A. Robinson who, towards the end of their career, start to write about the history of their field. For example, in this paper entitled Logic, Computers, Turing and von Neumann, I claim that Robinson implicitly relies on the hourglass model. You can tell from the title what the paper is about. Likewise for Martin Davis and his 2000 book, The Universal Computer, The Road. It's The Road from Leibniz to Turing. So in these books, which are about the history of computing, history of computer science, the authors hardly refer to any primary sources. It's all secondary sources, second-hand accounts mostly, and I have scrutinized these writings in my published paper, so I feel confident presenting this here. In fact, during the past seven, eight years, historians have rectified this romantic view of Turing and von Neumann in the history of science. Now, the sieve model is much more realistic. Uh, the historian will prefer the sieve model as opposed to the hourglass model. We have all these parallel developments shown here on the right hand side, all these parallel de developments like for example Howard Aiken on one line, Konrad Zuse on another, Morris Wilkes on yet, yet another and so on and so forth. That's better and then even much better is the realistic model which I will show you graphically in a moment. If you have all the time in the world, then you can try to capture reality in a historical paper. As I will show you graphically here on the right hand side, you have converging and diverging developments. That is of course, this is of course reality. And this explains why historians don't write so many articles. They need lots of time to write one article. It also explains why it's very difficult often to read these papers. Nevertheless, there are exceptions, exceptions such as Paul Ciruzzi's 2012 book, which, in my opinion, adheres to the realistic model. If not the realistic model, at least the sieve model, especially with regard to the history of hardware. Now we have all these circles, all these computer building groups, and so we have Alan Turing and John von Neumann. If you put on your spectacles that are 
made by a theoretician, then you can consider these two people to be exceptional. But if you put on other spectacles, you might appreciate more of the work of Morris Wilkes and some other computer building group. Or yet a third color for yet a third reason, a third way to look at the history of computer building. And yet a fourth way, so everybody had something to offer. Of course, this is still an oversimplification, but it's a better one than the hourglass model. Pluralism is then the name of the game. And like I said, Paul Ciudzi's book, in my opinion, actually comes close to presenting such an historical account. Let's zoom in now on Alan Turing in the, well, from 36 till the 1940s, after the war, when he was involved in computer building in the UK. In 1936, and I'm now quoting or paraphrasing from my own work, and I will provide references later. In 1936, Turing introduced his automatic machines which a year later were called Turing machines by Alonzo Church, but they should not be confused with the modern Turing machines of the 1950s up till the present day. So these automatic machines of Turing did not contain a finite output nor an input, as was the case, or as is the case with the later devised Turing machines due to Stephen Clenet, Clenny, I'm a European, so I'm going to say Stephen Cleany, and Martin Davies in the 50s and in later decades. Seems like we have a bit of a glitch here. All right, Turing wanted each of his machines to compute and print infinitely many digits because it had to compute a representation, it had to print a representation of a real number. And in general, a real number requires infinitely many digits. A real number between 0 and 1. This is very different. This is very different from the modern Turing machines as they are taught today. Examples of real numbers are pi and 1 over 4. Let me elaborate. Let's take 1 over 4. So what did Turing exactly want in his 1936 paper? Well, for example, the machine computing 1 over 4 Computing the representation of 1 over 4, printed the digits 0 and 1, and then forever the digit 0. Does anybody know why? Because 1 over 4 is represented as 0 0.1000 at infinitum. So the machines of Turing, which he considered to be good, if you like, which he considered to be circle-free, were the ones that did not halt, to use terminology of the 1950s. And there is no such thing as the halting problem in Turing's 36 paper. From 1936 till 1958, Turing, Emil Post, Alonzo Church, Stephen Cleany, Martin Davis, Saul Gorn, and I'm sure others, well, they recast the concept of Turing's 1936 automatic machine to what we today call a Turing machine. Same holds then for the universal Turing machine concept. Several years were needed for the term universal Turing machine to acquire an invariant meaning just look at some of the papers of Mart that Martin Davis wrote in the 50s and you'll see that he was playing around with the definition of a universal Turing machine. This is common. Uh, these epistemological developments are common in the beginnings of a science. A modern definition of a universal Turing machine one can find in Martin Davis's 1958 book Computability and Unsolvability. This book influenced the first generation of computer scientists in the 60s, as Donald Knuth has conveyed in one of my oral histories with him.
All right, we have Charles Petzl's book, The Annotated Turing, from 2008. I highly recommend this. It explains Turing's paper of 36 thoroughly. And then we have Alan Turing, The Enigma, the 1983 biography of Andrew Hodges, which I will rely on now in the coming five, ten minutes. I will paraphrase Andrew Hodges. And um, I'm specifically referring to Hodges' 1983 not to any of the later editions. It's a biography of Alan Matheson Turing and in the English-speaking literature this is probably the best book around. I will, in a follow-up lecture, have a lot to say about Turing scholars from Germany, France, Italy and so on. So paraphrasing Hodges, Turing did, was not taken seriously. Yes, I just said that. Turing was not taken seriously by most of his contemporaries. Not in logic, where he was taken seriously, modern logic, but in the area of computer building in the 1940s. This is my reading of Hodges's biography and I will provide some references later. These page numbers are to Hodges' 1983 book in case you want to double check on what I am saying here. Like so many grand or big scientists, the recognition only came after his death. Now Turing's 1936 paper meant a lot to him. It meant a lot to Turing with regard to computer building. And it also meant a lot to some of his close colleagues, such as the grandson of the famous Charles Darwin in 1946. The grandson, Darwin, was involved in building computers in the United Kingdom. But Turing's 1936 paper had little impact on the computer building community at large. Okay, This is how I read probably the most thorough biography from 1983, which was when Turing was not yet as famous and oversold as it is today, as he is today. All right, so continuing with Hodges, we can ask the question, what then made Turing special if he wasn't taken seriously? Because everybody was special and definitely Turing was special. Tur Turing, excuse me, had the remarkable ability to unify seemingly disparate theoretical and practical concepts. This Think about this. He had the theoretical bird's eye view in the 1940s when everybody was actually very practically inclined when we discuss computer building. The theoretically inclined logicians, if you like, were not at all involved in computer building or programming, with a few exceptions. Now Turing needed just one tape in his 36 paper and he needed just one electronic memory in the 1940s. So he was able to get to the basics of computability not making it too simple, but making it simple enough, or as simple as possible. The idea to unify, for example, to store data and instructions in one memory, just to give an example, was something the engineers had come up independently of Turing. Let that be very clear. So this idea to unify was not solely Turing's, nor did it require knowledge of Turing's 36 paper per se. This is always the case in major developments in a field, many people come to a similar conclusion from different angles. But Turing's unification was unlike that of most of his contemporaries, also theoretical in nature. I can't stress, stress that enough. He was, if you like, ahead of the game and perhaps AHEAD, the word AHEAD has to be printed in capital because that has drawbacks if you're ahead of the game. 
Based on his 1936 paper, Turing was able to see that one general purpose machine could do the job of the jobs of several special purpose machines. I do want to emphasize that this insight came for many other people acquired this insight in later years without depending on Turing's paper at all. As I explained in my 2012 book, The Dawn of Software Engineering from Turing to Dijkstra. But Turing definitely had the insight and he had a theoretical grounding as well. All right, so all of this is my reading of Andrew Hodges. This grander picture of computing was something Turing was not able to convey clearly to most of his contemporaries, who were, by the way, uh, think of Morris Wilkes, for example, contemporary, contemporaries who were eagerly and successfully building computers. So this is a very nuanced position and I think it I think it doesn't get any more nuanced than this, well not much maybe some historian will always add more nuance but then probably with regard to slightly adjacent topics so Andrew Hodges 1983 putting Turing into a historical context also asks the following very good question what about Charles Babbage then? If Turing had this theoretical bird's eye view, was he the first ever to have it, if you like? Well, what about Charles Babbage more than a century before? I've not consulted primary sources with regard to Babbage, so I'm now totally relying on secondary sources and on Hodges' book in particular. Hodges, Hodges, excuse me, Hodges distinguished between Babbage's universal physical machine, and I am paraphrasing, regardless of whether Babbage ever built it, and Turing's notion of what a universal physical machine had to entail in the 1940s. A distinction can be made in order to convey that Turing did not have any priority with regard to this theoretical bird's eye view. If I would have to choose sides, I would put it that way as I will explain in a moment. Babbage had not stored instructions internally in his machine, while Turing planned in the 1940s to do precisely that. So one would think that, well, maybe this has implications, this observation. Well, those who are versed in computability theory will agree with me that it doesn't have any implications. And Hodges implicitly conveyed this in his 1983 book. So what did Hodges say? Well, at least implicitly, storing instructions externally on, say, paper tape, which is what Turing did in 1936 in his theoretical paper and what Babbage did more than a century before, physically, or storing instructions externally, excuse me, storing it internally in computer memory, well, theoretically speaking, that does not matter at all. It does not matter in terms of Turing's universality. So, there is no reason to claim that Turing was the first, if you like. Of course, Turing was the first to have the notion of what we today call a universal Turing machine, if you like. Although one should be even careful with that statement, because, like I said, that, that notion only came in the 50s due to Martin Davis and some other people. Let me give some sources, references. The best historical paper of the Turing and John von Neumann connection, if there was any connection, is due to the historian Leo Curry, written in 2017 in the communications of the ACM. The title being Turing's pre-war analog computers, the fatherhood of the modern computer revisited. 
without doubt that's the best one around if you ask me also interesting and also published in the CACM communications of the ACM we have a paper of Thomas Haig of January 2014 with regard to the question did Turing invent the modern computer or not my own paper in that same journal in October 2014 and then we have Martin Bullink and his co-authors uh, in 2015 that's also very interesting because what Bullink does is he compares a hero in mathematics Gauss with a hero in computer science Turing and explains why a discipline needs heroes for the sake of building up or fortifying its discipline. So that was the first section of my lecture. So there was a quick break. I discussed before the break the 1930s, 1940s and Alan Turing's contributions if you like in the area of computer building. Now we have the 1950s which I describe as a decade of cross fertilization. What do I mean with that? Well I mean actually fertilization between three disciplines. We have natural language, we have artificial language, and we have by the end of the 50s, not before, the notion of a programming language. Three, la three types of language and people in each community influenced people in any of the other two communities. So we have the linguistics and we have the linguists such as Noam Chomsky, to give one famous example. We have the logicians, such as Stephen Kleene or Martin Davis. And then we have the applied mathematicians who used computers, real computing machinery in the early 50s, provided they had one at their institutes, at least one. And somebody like Saul Gorn had more than one computing machinery at his institutes in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia at least. I'll say more about that later. So Saul Gorn is one of those unsung heroes of computer science and I'll say more about him in the coming half an hour. In 1955 he described, and I'm quoting him, an ideal general purpose machine as effectively equivalent To a universal Turing machine. So he's equating real computing machinery with the abstract notion of a Turing machine. This you see all over the place in computer science today. This conflation which is not necessarily harmful at all, it could be very powerful. <clears throat> Hence Gorn's ideal machine had unlimited, that is infinite, storage capacity. He was very well aware of this and he explained, clarified, emphasized the discrepancy between this infinite abstraction of real computing technology and the existing machines, the existing technology which was finite and had a finite storage capacity. One should be very careful when working with the infinite abstraction to keep in mind that at some point one will have to bridge the gap and go towards the real technology. I'm talking for example about round off errors in numerical mathematics when using a computer, a real physical computer. Now this tension between the finite and the infinite, we will find this all over the place, not only in this lecture but in coming lectures. So as an intermezzo, let I, I zoom in on John Backus, 1958-59, he had by then contributed to creating 
the Fortran programming system and he played a major role also in the, the design of the Algol programming language. So the finite Fortran or the machine specific aspect of Fortran in blue and in red we have the infinite, we have Algol and the machine independent nature of Algol. That's the contrast that I want to make here. From the informal to the formal, when I think about IBM machines Fortran running on IBM machines, I'm thinking about an informal uh, specification as I will illustrate in a moment, right now in fact. So what you will have to, as a Fortran programmer, you have to respect the following verbose constraints that the number used, any number used in your Fortran program must be less than 10 to the power 38 in absolute value. That number, 10 to the power 38, is IBM specific because Fortran was designed for IBM machines. And your numbers have to be greater than 10 to the power minus 38 in absolute value. So that's an example of an informal specification and it's machine specific or at least specific to a brand of computing machinery. In Algol, this is how one formally specified the nature, the syntactic nature of integers. A digit can be 0, 1, 2, up to 9, and an integer is either a digit or an integer followed by a digit. So we have a concise formal specification, which is machine independent because an integer can be arbitrary large. And we call this the Bacchus Nauer form notation. That's what we call it today. It's, we're talking here about integers that can be arbitrary large and due to the recursion actually built in we have a concise specification. Now where is the recursion? It's a nice example of one of the first examples of recursion in computer programming in the syntax syntax if you like an integer is defined in terms of an integer and of course there's a whole history to be told here going back to Chomsky for example how did Bacchus how did Bacchus actually come up with this idea <clears throat> well this has to do with cross fertilization influence from linguistics which actually comes from logic all the way to computer programming much more is told in two very important papers which are mentioned are specified on my website that's the paper of David Nofre, Mark Priestley and Gerd Alberts and which is about the advent of the language metaphor in computer programming which is precisely what I'm talking about and then there's a 2015 paper by myself entitled Towards a Historical Notion of Turing, the father of computer science. So, coming back to Saul Gorn, Saul Gorn in the early 1950s, he had three exclamation mark general purpose machines. <clears throat> at his institute, it's the INIAC, the, the EDVAC and the ORDVAC. While in the early 50s somebody like Maurice Wilkes in Cambridge had just one computing machine and people in Copenhagen or Amsterdam were still trying to get one computing machine operational. So you, there's a big difference between the superpower, the USA, and then all these other nations in the post-war years. Gorin said, like, and I am now repeating myself, but I will go into more detail in a moment, that there is the need for a code more or less independent of the machine. So he was, Gorin was striving for machine independent notation. So that the artists, scientists and professions can then return to a common language and creative thinking. So these reflections, this bird's eye view coming from Saul Gorn, 
at Aberdeen Proving Ground in Philadelphia was something that you cannot expect most practitioners to have had. They were very much busy with the practice. We have Saul Gorn here with the bird's eye view reflecting and appropriating ideas from modern logic and from Stephen Kleene's book in particular. Based on teaching, because there are, he has a variety of computers and work pressure, you want to abstract away from the machine. All right, so Saul Gorn and Logic, 1945 Logic. Logical connections, that's what's written up there out of your view. And I'm quoting him, if we can provide such a universal code, note that the word universal is here used totally independent of this universal Turing machine, just to be clear. And you, when you see me back up all of a sudden, that's because there's some bee flying around thinking I'm some big flower. If we can provide such a universal code, the reluctance to teach programming would disappear for another reason. The logic behind the programming is a type of dynamic symbolic logic. Which are known to themselves all controllers of large scale routine operations are using. So everybody in all these different practical disciplines are actually doing something very similar. All these different controllers, whether they are computers, human computers, just to be clear, whether they are data processors, whether they are production engineers, whether they are traffic controllers or administrators of large companies. They are all indirectly or unconsciously relying on a dynamic symbolic logic. That's Saul Gorn with his bird's eye view in 1954. He says, it is no accident that all such people make use of flow charts. And then the final sentence is, and now you see the academic aspect of his um, viewpoint. Surely the universities will teach a discipline that so many types of minds will need. I emphasize that most people did not think like Saul Gorn, but a few people had the profile of a Saul Gorn, somebody like John Carr or Alan J. Perlis, and all three of all these three, these three people were all involved in the association of computing machinery. So they were influential, historically speaking. And they were connecting practice to theory, connecting computer programming to recast notions of Turing machine computability. So I'm giving this presentation in mid-October 2019 some seven years after I actually went to Philadelphia to dig into the Saul Gorn papers. Gorn in 1954 said the following, and I think I might be repeating myself a little bit, but then I go into more detail. So Saul Gorn said, 
may be expressed by saying that the language of the machine includes its own syntax so that not only may the machine be directed to tell us something but it may also be directed to tell us something about the way in which it tells us something. And this is illustrated more vividly in my 2015 article. So we see Gorn connect now to metamathematics. So he says, those of us who have had the time, and there are not many people who had the time, to follow recent developments in symbolic and logic, which is by no means obvious. This was not obvious at all for most computer practitioners. Well, those people will know that languages which include their own syntax and so uh, there is a reference here to meta mathematics but this is not the way a logician would actually have phrased what would have framed it well those of us who have had the time to follow recent developments in symbolic logic, know that languages which include their own syntax have all sorts of interesting and quasi-paradoxal properties, as revealed in the researches of Kurt Gödel. So, indeed, already in the 50s we see some highly influential people in computing make connections between modern logic, the work of Kurt Gödel, for example, and Alan Turing, and computer programming. Gorn, in 1955, writes about Turing machines. Again, effectively equivalent is what he uses the ideal general purpose machine is effectively equivalent to a universal Turing machine and more interestingly he refers explicitly to Kleene's 1952 book Meta Mathematics or on Meta Mathematics and then Gorn says that the universal Turing machine can copy the description of any special purpose Turing machine and indicate its operation by means of these copied specifications. So clearly we see Saul Gorn make an analogy between special purpose Turing machines and universal Turing machines on the one hand and all these programming notations and different types of machines on the other hand. In a sense, the, the problem of program portability is what all of this was about. Hence the link to Turing machines and universal Turing machines. So Kleenier in his 52 book, somewhere towards the end, writes in quite some detail about Turing machines in the modern sense of the word, but then we have Ken Kemeny, if I'm not mistaken, a PhD student of, student of Alonzo Church, who writes a beautiful article about Turing machines entitled Man Viewed as a Machine in Scientific American 1955, and here's a picture in the lower half. You have a picture of a Turing machine in John Kemeny's article. The top half is from is an extract from Kleene's 1952 book, which is also partly about Turing machines. So Turing machines do start to enter the picture of a developing discipline, which was later called computer science. But again, I emphasize that these are 
appropriations. These are recast notions of Turing's original 1936 automatic machines. And so in a letter in 1957 from Gorm to Alan J. Perlis, who would later become the first Turing Award winner, we see him write that it has been recognized that all general purpose machines from EDVAC on are essentially equivalent anyone being capable of the same end results I would say the same input output behavior as any other with varying degrees and types of efficiency these two principles which are now standard in computer science Thus, two principles are recognized, that of the equivalence of hardware and programming and that of the equivalence of our general purpose machines. With a certain, as yet, ill-defined universal command language, which was later called ALGOL. And probably, he says, in terms of mathematical logic, it is the class of a of expressions obtainable by general recursive definitions. Classification of specifying languages, which appeared in the communications of the ACM, if I'm not mistaken, in 1961. And I'm just giving you a general idea. So his table consists of 13 entries. At position 1 we have natural languages. At the, all the way at the bottom we have flowcharts. Second to last we have Turing machines. And then we have, at number 2 we have regular expressions. Number 3 we have Bacchus normal form, now called Bacchus normal form. And at position 6 we have state diagrams. So, I am not at all sure how Gorn actually viewed all these languages, this classification of his. At position 10 we have propositional logic with time variables. This is rather different from the Chomsky hierarchy as we know it today and it is rather different from Chomsky's work which I have yet to explain in a future video. So this is where the state of the art is at this point. If anybody can delve into the writings of Saul Gorn, it would be much appreciated. Now, things that are also unclear to me. So we have Saul Gorn writing about mechanical languages and processors. And I, just to be clear, I'm not the only one who doesn't understand this. Historical actors at the time whom, I'm, whom I have interviewed did not really understand a lot of what Saul Gorn was trying to communicate. He says, I will, however, extend the concept of processor to include the concepts of mechanism, of automaton, of procedure, of routine, of subroutine, of program, of algorithm, of a person who has been programmed, or a person who has been routinized, or a person who has been algorithmized. of, in fact, any appropriately assembled system. Of mechanisms and programs and algorithmized people. So those are three categories which are number one, two and three of what Saul Gorn meant with an assembled system. Mechanisms, programs, algorithmized people. If anybody can shed light on this, I would be most great, grateful.
course it was not just Saul Gorn. I'm, I'm, I have to simplify my exposition by focusing on one person and I chose Saul Gorn, but as an intermezzo let's say something about John W. Carver III, University of Michigan, who I believe was um, president of the ACM in the late 50s. For specific details, check out um, my 2015 article. So in 56, John Carr said many things which I will quote right now, which are clearly related to what later became known as strong artificial intelligence. So he says that based on Turing's proof about universal machines, living organisms can be abstractly defined as a symbol manipulator. Number two, actions of living beings can be described by a program. Number three, digital computers have all the features of universal Turing machines. So here we see a conflation again between an abstract concept such as a universal Turing machine and a digital computer. And then number four, digital computers can duplicate human beings. Again, we have here, in my opinion, a conflation between digital computers and human beings, which is a common conflation and a powerful one to make, especially in what today is called, or what was considered strong AI uh, a decade or two later. That's for another lecture, the history of artificial intelligence. It wasn't just Saul Gorn and it wasn't just John Carr. In another domain, in, lingui in linguistics, we have Noam Chomsky, who had a great influence on the beginnings of computer science with his Chomsky, which is now called the Chomsky hierarchy. And so just a small passage here, he writes, it can be shown that the grammar is essentially a Turing machine. Just again to quickly illustrate that the notion of Turing machine became very popular in various niches in the 1950s. Now the third part of my talk, becoming a historian or thinking like a historian. Let me say something about that because I think it can help computer scientists to further their own research agenda. So these are some takeaway messages that could be useful to you. Every technology is shaped by its use and users. Every theoretical concept is shaped by the theoretician who defines the concept and uses it accordingly. Technology obtains its meaning from being used, and the same holds for a theoretical concept such as the universal Turing machine. So, what I've learned is to try to avoid using technological concepts or theoretical concepts such as the Turing machine as subjects of my sentences. Instead, I try to focus on the historical actors, and I will illustrate this in a moment. Of course, I do not always follow these guidelines, but it is useful. It's good to keep this in mind every now and then. So here's a specific example. I should avoid writing the following. During the 1950s, a universal Turing machine became widely accepted as a conceptual abstraction of a physical computer. There's no subject, no historical actor in that sentence, that's the problem. Instead, write like this. By 1955, I'm giving a specific date, Saul Gorn, I'm giving a specific historical actor, viewed a universal Turing machine as a conceptual abstraction of his computers. Remember, he had three 
general purpose computers in the early 50s. That's a more specific, more informative message and it's easier to defend because I can give the primary sources to defend such a claim. Now, is it just Saul? I mean Saul who? Well, it's Saul Gorn. Like I said, he's an unsung hero if you like. So many people don't know him, but he was an influential ACM member in the 1950s and 60s. So it matters a great deal. Now, was it just him? Well, no, it was also John Carr and Alan Perlis. And in Great Britain, we had Maurice Wilkes, Andrew Booth. They called themselves the Space Cadets. And again, I have to refer to my 2015 article for the full picture. So you can generalize from Saul Gorn to a group of people called the Space Cadets. Now for more methodology, if you are interested in more methodology, I refer to chapter 1 in my Turing Tales book published in 2016. This chapter will be available on the website with regards to this lecture. So. Thank you very much.